administrative coordinator. Uh, first, thank you uh, for the tech support from Paula Zamaglio and uh, Connie Rinaldo, and also from uh, Silva Mora and Vicente Ruiz Gerardo from JB Spain, JB, Spain, uh, JB France, JB Spain, and the technical coordinator of the Living Atlasis uh, community. They will, they will help us with any questions that you may have and uh, with the chats. So uh, we have a document uh, where we. we where you will be able to ask any question and uh, people will try to answer live. And if there, there is no answer, we will try to uh, uh, answer you at the end of each talk. Uh, please add your name and your institution and, uh, and an email if you want us to contact you later after the, the symposium. Uh, you can use uh, the chat for technical questions or conversing with other attendees. Uh, please use the chat, chat judiciously as any inappropriate use of the chat may result in you being removed from the session uh, or the chat function being disabled. Uh, please see the code of conduct for more information. And please keep the microphone muted during all of the symposium. Uh, so this session will be divided in four talks. Uh, the first one will be the new Living Atlasis community that I'm going to do. It will be followed by the technical remote session that Manash Shah from JB uh, Sweden will do. And then back to me again. Sorry, you will hear a lot about <laughs> with my absolutely great accent uh, about the communication within the community. And finally, Dave uh, Martin and Javier Morina will uh, talk about the Aligning JBIF and Atlas of Living Australia uh, platform. So let's begin. So let's talk about the new Living Atlasis community. But before everything, uh, I'm going to do. Um, sorry, I need to remove you. Uh, uh, I'm going to start with some key points and key dates from the beginning of the community up to today. So everything starts in February 2013 during the first international workshop around the Atlas of Living Australia uh, platform. Uh, it was in Costa Rica and it was a, a CSP project, I think, between uh, Atlas of Living Australia and the Costa Rican GBIF node. Uh, in, November, in November 2014, GBIF Spain launched the first data portal based on ALE. So this was the first, and now we are 25 data portals. But it's important to, uh, this launch was important because it's the first one where we will be able to see that it is possible to use the LA platform in another institution. Uh, regarding the Living Atlases and the community and the Tadwick, uh, in October 2017, um, we had our first workshop during in uh, uh, Ottawa. Even if we did, we present poster and did presentation before uh, in a, a older Sadwick, but this is the first workshop uh, on reusing an open source platform to create a community. And since this workshop, we did two symposium, one in Dunedin and the other in Leiden about the community and our, our progress uh, to uh, make our community durable. Oh. Um, since 2013, the Living Atlasis and uh, its participants have managed at least eight funded projects from CSP uh, project, but also European projects. And we managed, and most of them, the main goal was to fund a technical workshop and improve our documentation. Today, we launched the community, I mean, the participants launched 25 data portal in production. We have, uh, 107 members in the JBIF Node Developer Channel on the uh, Atlas of Living Australia Slack uh, with a LA technical team member, obviously. And the data portal are available in six languages. 
and you have a link where you'll be able to see the uh, progress for the uh, translation in each lang language. But before everything, we need to remember that the Living Atlas is community in the community of people and different type, I mean type, different uh, background of people. So we have a data manager, we have GBIF node, uh, um, uh, node manager, and most of them are uh, developers. But since 2013, the community changed. I mean, we make, I think, huge progress to make our community uh, durable. And everything start with during the governing board uh, 25 in Kilkenny, I think it was in November 2018. And uh, during this meeting, uh, they create the, what we call the Kilkenny Accord. And it's the first document that outline the new living Atlassian community. And in this uh, document, we have the first description of the living Atlassian coordinator and the living Atlassian management committee. So in uh, May, uh, April, April and May 2019, uh, the community uh, get two coordinators. So Vicente uh, is a technical coordinator. Uh, he, his tasks are mainly about the technical part at desk, how to uh, improve uh, the, the installation, the maintenance of uh, tools for newcomers, but also for participants. Uh, current participants. Uh, I'm not going to talk a lot uh, about this part because Manash will do a talk about it uh, uh, at the end and after this presentation. And myself, the technical coordinator, who uh, my main task is uh, communication inside the community but also outside the community, um, the, uh, helping the community um, management committee to create a governance and a, a funding project, and not funding, pining project. Uh, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about the Living Atlassian Community Management. Uh, it's composed of participants of the Living Atlassian Community, plus uh, JBIF uh, Secretaria and uh, boss coordinators, but uh, Vicente and myself doesn't have the, uh, don't have the voting rights. The, Main goal of this committee is to help define the future for the LA community from governance project, but also roadmaps. Uh, so it helps also define tasks for both coordinator and uh, both uh, Vicente and myself need to send reports of our day-to-day -day tasks to see how we, uh, how our work is done and how we help the community to be uh, durable. Uh, today, there is only one ongoing project, and it's uh, led by the JBIF Brazil. It's a CSP uh, uh, project uh, that starts in August 2020 and will end in October 2021. Um, the CSP is, uh, project is uh, focused on Latin America and uh, Caribbean countries, uh, JBIF nodes, and, uh, and one of the focus, not all of the focus, at all are on the LA models. Um, this is important because it's, uh, it's a project where the community is not the core of the project. And it also, it's also important because it creates um, a regional sub-community inside the, the Living Atlases community. Uh, we had we try to uh, answer uh, two project calls, European project calls. So the first one was the Erasmus Plus. Unfortunately, due to all of what happened in 2020 with the pandemics and everything, we were not able to submit it. Uh, but uh, we will do it in 2021 because the uh, Erasmus Plus program has been, um, uh, there will be a new, session from 2021 to 2027, I think. And then the second one is the cost action. Um, and even if we wrote the proposal, we, were, we are not able to submit it because we need at least half of the partners to be part of the cost inclus inclusiveness target countries. 
and you have the list uh, uh, at the bottom of the slide. And we only today we only have three uh, countries: Estonia, Luxembourg, and Portugal, who are part of this uh, of the community. And we didn't receive any interest from other countries. So, but again, it, the proposal is writing, so we will be able to reuse it if we need it. And um, the cost uh, program, uh, I think, end in 2020, but I don't know yet if it's been uh, uh, relaunched for, for the 10 uh, next year. And uh, I'm going to uh, uh, end my presentation with what's the memorandum of understanding. So that is the main document that we create, uh, we write in since one year now, for one year now. And uh, uh, it's, it's the base to create a more structured community. Um, hello. Sorry, it will be released soon by the Living Atlasis Management Committee and by the JBF Secretariat. And it defines several points among others, such as the goal for the uh, Living Atlasis Community and its participants. So it means the development and code. So we have the help desk that we already uh, improved thanks, uh, thanks to the uh, Vicente, the technical coordinator, and all of the communities that now are really uh, helping each other, the internationalization. And we would like to, pro and this document will help us to promote cult the culture of sharing. So uh, when the new feature is developed in one of our participants, the main idea is to send it back to the main project. Um, uh, the documentation in several language, uh, but the technical documentation, but also the and user communication uh, documentation, uh, and also the community uh, system sustainability by promoting in a biodiversity and informatic community as we do uh, right now. And we would like also to promote partnership between participants. That's why the CSP uh, ongoing project is really important because it's partnership between participants of the community. Oh, sorry. I, um, it will also. Oh, sorry. I'm. Oh no. Sorry. Um, it also defines uh, the the roles and the duties of the coordinator and the uh, management community. Uh, it set direction and strategy and pro priorities for the community and the coordinators. And uh, finally, the last point, it's the um, annual budget. So what we call the annual budget is what we think that we need to uh, fund during the year. So workshop, technical and administrative coordinators position mainly. And uh, we also describe what we call financial and income contribution par by participants of the Living Atlasis community. So the financial contribution uh, shall be decided by the participant up to 5,000 uh, euro per year. And the income contribution, it's what we call um, the, what the participant can do for the community to help the community, such as hosting an event. We know that the, the host of a technical workshop uh, has much more work than the participant of the workshop, even if it's helped by the, it will be helped by the um, administrative coordinator. Uh, we also talk about sharing infrastructure, hosting infrastructure. As Manash, we will talk uh, in the next presentation. We will, uh, in the remote sessions, they need virtual machine. Right now, JB Spain share is on virtual machine, but maybe other participants will be able to share, uh, um, to borrow some of the virtual machine for this uh, session. Uh, and also presenting the community and all of our tools um, during conference, like, again, like Manash we will do in the next uh, presentation. So uh, thank you for uh, listening to me. Um, this is some link. So we have the Slack channel if you want to be part. Uh, and it's more for technical questions. 
uh, you can contact me or Vicente, you have both our email address at the end of the, at the bottom of the slide, uh, our Twitter account and the, the website. So thank you very much. And now I'm going to let Manash uh, talk about the remote support session for the Living Atlasis portal deployments. It's your turn, Manash. Oh, maybe uh, we may have time for one or two questions. I don't know if there is question. There haven't been questions in the chat nor in the document, Mary, so far. Okay. So do you have any question or we have like two minutes? I don't see any hands raised either. So. Okay, so Manach, it's your turn. Uh, thank you, Mary. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Manach Sa. I'm based at the Swedish Museum of Natural History here in Stockholm, Sweden. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about uh, the newly introduced remote support sessions for Living Atlas portal development. Uh, I'm doing this presentation on behalf of the Living Atlas community. Uh, Mari introduced a few concepts about the Atlas of Living Australia portal, uh, the history. And uh, continuing on that, uh, I would like to add a few things. Uh, so the Atlas of Living Australia, or AALA as we call it, uh, it's an open source IT infrastructure. Uh, it comes as a multiple component uh, microservice based architecture system, which means it's not a monolith and has a number of different modules or verticals uh, which you are able to install in parts or uh, as a whole entire uh, singular system. Uh, having microservice based architecture, uh, which is uh, quite a new paradigm, it is a great uh, concept, but it does come with its own set of challenges. And so uh, the AALA itself provides the scope to deploy and maintain the portal. Uh, uh, following is the link uh, to the repo itself and uh, the official code uh, to deploy and maintain the stack is Ansible based. Uh, so, uh, sorry, Manash, I think we don't see your slide. We are still see what, uh, seeing the first slide. Uh -huh. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, do we? Do you, you have, have a, to do you have a present mode because it looks uh, to me yeah. like this is just the um not the slide I'm actually, mode. I'm actually well, in the present mode. Maybe, maybe the, you you have two two screens maybe maybe it's, it's yeah maybe it's the not problem. the right do, yeah do, maybe you should try your the other screen sure uh, let me stop sharing uh, Uh, is it okay now? It's still not in present mode. It's in, it's in, um, you know, we can see all the, we can see all the slides on the side. Uh -huh. Now it's good. That's better. Yeah, that's good. Sorry about that. Uh, no worries. Thank you. Uh, should I restart? Uh, uh, okay. Uh, it's moving so, along too, so that's good. 
So the aspects of living Australia or the AED, it's an open source IT infrastructure. Uh, uh, it's modular, uh, which means it's come in multiple component and has microservice based architecture, uh, which means uh, uh, different components uh, can be installed at different verticals or viewed as verticals. Uh, this is a new, new paradigm, but uh, comes with its own challenges. And so the Atlas of Living Australia provides the official code to deploy and maintain the portal. Uh, the code itself is Ansible based and uh, there's the repo uh, hosted on GitHub. Uh, just to briefly introduce what Ansible is, so it's a software that's used for provisioning of your uh, machines, for management of the configuration for your uh, software to deploy those applications. And in general, it provides uh, uh, this entire infrastructure as a code, or you can uh, build your infrastructure uh, uh, on a virtualized environment as a code. Uh, to elaborate, uh, the Ansible code provided by the AED uh, it can be used to set up and maintain the AED portal. Uh, uh, the Ansible code, uh, or the playbooks as it's called, uh, describes the different steps and actually the steps uh, to automate those uh, things, steps necessary to do the deployment. So it could uh, the steps to say install this particular artifact, uh, create or copy the files and folder, apply certain permission to the files or the uh, folder system, uh, restart or uh, stop the service. Uh, this allows a reuse of common or similar steps. Uh, it also allows rerunning the process in parts or, or full uh, as necessary. And it minimizes the manual steps that an administrator is required to perform in the server. Uh, it's written in YAML language and it's human readable, uh, a text language. And also it allows uh, the developers or the DevOps personnel to share and replicate the process. Uh, another concept is Ansible inventories. Uh, the Ansible inventories can be uh, viewed as a set of configuration files or variables to define the portal. Uh, uh, they provide information regarding the portal. Uh, you can define uh, which server resources uh, to use uh, for a particular set of services. Uh, if you have a cluster of machine, uh, you can distribute the services among those machines and so define in the Ansible screen itself, uh, which services you would want to deploy to which servers. Uh, uh, it also provides a mean to uh, apply password and security policies or variables. And other uh, variables like the domain name itself, uh, like if you have a multiple domain or subdomains uh, and things like organization's name or emails uh, that are shared across uh, different services within the platform. Uh, recently, uh, as Marty introduced, uh, after the Kilkenny Accord and after uh, having the Living Atlas Technical Coordinator, uh, effort were put into creating this tool called Generator Living Atlas. Uh, and this utility uh, was actually worked on after realizing that uh, for a new institution, uh, which is uh, trying to install the Living Atlas portal and customize uh, from scratch, uh, uh, it can be quite a, a steep learning curve to do the installation and deployment process itself. And so, this utility is help to obtain or create those inventory files required for the Living Atlas portal. Uh, the purpose of this was to simplify the configuration, the installation, maintenance, and upgrade of the portal itself. Uh, using this tool, uh, one is able to get a functional configuration for the 
setting up of the Ansible scripts and inventories. And uh, it allows scaffolding some necessary inventory files and also uh, an optional uh, branding theme to just kickstart your installation. Uh, it is available as a web application uh, on the link below uh, and also as a, a node package uh, that can be run as an interactive uh, command line tool. Uh, this allows uh, rerunning of or updating of the modules uh, as uh, you have a set of inventories and it's quite interactive and you, all you do is uh, fill in some of the uh, responses and then generate the inventories. Uh, just a screenshot of the generator. Uh, uh, so basically a, a simple action while interacting with this generator would be to uh, assign like the, let's say the subdomain or your application context uh, where the application would be deployed and the machine that you would want it to run on. And at the end, after responding or uh, adding your uh, values there, you are able to generate and download the basic scaffolded uh, files. Uh, the same thing can be run as a command line tool. Uh, uh, it's an interactive as well. Uh, However, uh, we do have wikis and documentation and the community support and the Slack channel, but sometimes that might not be enough to kickstart, uh, especially uh, with limited resources and limited personnel. So in that case, uh, the community has remote sessions that have uh, been recently started and would provide it. Uh, so, uh, the remote sessions are normally conducted by the Living Atlas technical coordinator, uh, and it includes a basic introduction to the Living Atlas platform. Uh, uh, includes uh, bootstrapping a new Living Atlas platform. Uh, it could be a test installation run on like a, uh, a shared instance or a shared server uh, provided by GDF Spain, or the remote session could be used to. Uh, uh, have their own products and deployment uh, if you have the resources to do so. Uh, the sessions are uh, prepared and conducted remotely uh, or have been done like that until now. Uh, there's a link uh, for more information. Uh, during the sessions, uh, some of the initial questions and doubts about uh, installing this or upgrading or how to kind of uh, technical questions are addressed and resolved. Uh, the using of the generator uh, to create the inventory files uh, are done. Uh, similarly, uh, some of, one of the major pain point that has been uh, during the uh, installation or deployment process has been uh, provisioning of different virtual machines. Uh, and so the, the coordinator has been helping on that as well. Uh, it includes the installation of the modules and the post installation steps as well. And sometimes uh, if there is interest and if my time permit, uh, there has been some uh, customization of the theme that has been uh, conducted. So, the remote session might not be able to cover everything. However, uh, the next thing uh, uh, would be uh, to uh, do the management of the data or the content itself. Uh, there might be uh, necessary for uh, security management or management of the security policy and that depends uh, and differs from one institution to another. Uh, help on customizing uh, the portal or the components, and sometimes scaling and moving the entire stack to products and itself. Uh, uh, 
from the experiences uh, of conducting few sessions until now, uh, uh, these the feedback could be summarized as uh, below. So most or all of the participants found the session helpful and useful to get an idea about the framework and it uh, helped to get up to speed with the installation and configuration. Uh, the participants recommend newcomers uh, to use the session because the explanation was very good and it's a good way to understand implementation of the software. Uh, however, there is always room for improvement. Uh, some of the feedback or recommendation was uh, to be able to start everything from scratch, from bare metal. So the virtualized environment we used was already set up. It could be more helpful if the sessions involved setting up the environment. Uh, I guess that would be something we should try and, uh, in the future. So yes, uh, that brings to the end of my uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Manash, for your presentation. Um, do you have, like, we have some time for two questions. So I know that there were questions on the document and Vicente is currently answering them, but maybe if you have one, another question. I don't see any raised hands. Okay, uh, so I think I'm we are going to the next presentation, and it will be me again. Marie, you do have one question that just got in the chat from Jory. Okay, let me stop. Um. I think I'm going to let uh, Vicente answer the, uh, uh, about the manage upgrade. It's another question too. So um, there's one on how do you get an occurrence data set into the platform? Uh, Vicente, Manaj, do you want to answer the question? Sorry, I was reading the, the wiki. Uh, which question? There's one on how do you get an occurrence data set into the platform, and then one on how do you manage upgrades? Yes, the, I will write the, about the upgrades in the, in the, in the wiki. But uh, about data, we normally get the data from the IPT or from, um, but uh, I think that after the, the Javier and Dave uh, uh, presentation, uh, maybe the, this part will be more, more clear. But uh, Allah, it's not about the uh, um, data management, can does it, you, you cannot, uh, enter records or is, is you get from the from from the from the provider etc um Uh, how do you get a, 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 an occurrence data set into the platform? There is a, a data management that is explained on the uh, wiki where you can uh, um, um, and actually 
it will be April on the during the workshop uh, in September. Uh, Manash explain uh, all of the uh, data management on the collectory uh, models and the um, uh, data administration. Um, so I think we can go to the next presentation. And I need to share my screen. So uh, the Living Atlases community, uh, so the communication and the documentation uh, within the uh, community. Um, I divide my presentation in uh, uh, three uh, parts. So the communication within the community. So it means from us, the coordinator to the, to the participants or between participants. Uh, the communication done by participants to their own uh, network, own community, or to the entire uh, informatic and uh, biodiversity community, and the communication outside the, com the community. So first, the communication with, uh, within the community. So what we did uh, last year, it's to, uh, uh, to, to do a survey uh, uh, inside our community to, uh, in order to, have some feedback on how to uh, create uh, a community that answer what the participants want and also um, uh, make the community uh, durable. Like I think it's the main point in each of our step, it's to make the community durable. So we create a, a, a survey and uh, we divide the survey in uh, five, four, uh, for a part, so what we call the community of practice, because uh, we wanted we want to create uh, a community based on the community of practice uh, schema, schema. What they um, expect from the community, so also about the contributions. So what I, I talk about in the first presentation, in kind contribution and um, financial contribution and everything around projects that we can do uh, in the community. So you have a link to the survey. So, uh, and the results as we were expecting uh, have helped us to define the future of the community and especially the uh, momentum of understanding. Safe ride. <laughs> so we receive um, 19 answer. Um, and uh, most of the participants agreed on helping the community with in-kind of financial contribution or even both, that's great. Um, and all the participants agreed to be a partner in future projects. So that means they are really interested to be a part of uh, the technical workshop or end user workshop. Um, because uh, I forgot to say that in the uh, first presentation, but between the first workshop and the last one was in uh, last year. Um, so the first workshop, we were maybe eight participants. And in the last one, we were 25 participants. So we know that there is an increase of need of this kind of workshop and people are really interested. So that's good that the people are also interesting to be invested in this kind of project. And what is really great is that we also receive ideas for the improvement of the community. Um, so in regarding the code and development, so obviously sharing, sharing development and tools. So what we call the uh, knowledge of sharing. Uh, improving training and e-learning that we start to do with the remote sessions, the technical remote session and, uh, and the workshop. Since two years now, we have, um, we did a different approach in the workshop. To be honest, we, uh, 
we took the idea from the bid uh, workshop where they divide each participant in subgroup where mentors and mentees. And uh, it was really great to see uh, the participant working together. Um, we try to be multi-language. So also, like I said, the CSP project in Latin America country and uh, Caribbean country is great because it's not the main language will not be maybe not English. So that's also important. We are in the international uh, community. So we need to be able to communicate in several language. Another example during our workshop, during the TIDWIC uh, working session in September, we were able to answer questions in six language. So people were able to ask any question in several language. So develop the regional community. So as I said, with the CSP project, a funding workshop, obviously. Uh, improve documentation that we already done. It's already on the our roadmap, roadmap and the webinar. So uh, we start to talk, to uh, work on this with uh, Vicente about how to create a webinar. Uh, we we know the limit and we need to define what could be useful for the community. So we are currently working on that with uh, Vicente. Um, so we have several tools to help the communication within the community. So the first one is a Slack channel uh, that you know, I think all know very well. And the LA uh, data portal, uh, the LA, uh, sorry, uh, mailing list. Um, the LA mailing list is more to com communicate with you about, with the community, about projects, about conferences, about not really technical questions. The technical question is really for the Slack channel. Uh, and I'm not going to speak about the technical documentation and communication as we already had a, a presentation about that. So now I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about the communication done by participants. Uh, so it's mostly tutorial exercise or video for the national community of end users. Uh, but it's also translation of news from the community on their website. For instance, JB France translate in French, JB Spain in Spanish, and I'm pretty sure there is also other uh, uh, participants to translate in their own language. Uh, and it's also sharing information about the community on their social media, like for instance, Costa Rica, who, 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 who chair all of the information about that, this conference on their uh, um, Twitter account. So it's really great to see that people, we are a community and we can community, uh, co communicate in a several language. And this is some example. There is not, the, I have not put the list of all of the exercise done by participants, but this is some example. And for instance, JB Spain, who, uh, who did a live demonstration of the uh, basic research uh, features during the workshop in September. They did two uh, um, uh, tutorial exercise um, in English and in Spanish for uh, users for their own data portal. We also have Canadians who did uh, the uh, advanced research part during the um, workshop in September. And this is really uh, interesting because uh, Canadians is one of the who have already a data portal in production before deciding to use ALA. So they had to uh, change and they had to um, um, teach how to use uh, as a already from network and user to use the new data portal. So they did a tutorial uh, in English and in French that you can find on their uh, website. And we also have the JB, uh, Brazil JBF note who did a, a video tutorial about how to use the Atlas of uh, SIP Brazil in a, in a Brazilian Portuguese. So it's also, Great. 
And to finish, I, I, I have not, as I said, uh, there is plenty of other examples, but to finish, we also have the Atlas of Living Australia, who did a lot of user guides to uh, use uh, um, the LA uh, platform. And uh, finally, uh, the communication outside the community. Um, so uh, it's a communication for uh, uh, promoting the uh, the living uh, atlas, uh, the Atlas of Living Australia platform, but also the Living Atlases. So we did two uh, videos uh, for end user. It's neutral videos, meaning that we didn't use a live data portal, but we create the Living Atlas as Atlas world. And uh, the first video will help you to, to know how to search and learn data. And the special region to, uh, uh, and the second video is uh, focused on special and region uh, modules. But what we did uh, during the uh, workshop um, in, um, in September, the, uh, during the uh, Tadwick uh, working session workshop was quite amazing because it was the first time that we did a workshop with seven live demonstration of data portal maintained and installed by participants. And that actually was really great to see. Uh, so yes, we have two videos and uh, to show you how the data portal works. But now we also create workshop for end users to show, yes, you, you are, we have proved that it's work for those institutions. Uh, so you have a link to the video of the workshop if you want to see. Um, so we, we use a, a data portal from uh, Brazil, from uh, Austria, the Biodiversity Atlas Austria, GB, uh, the um, GB France and uh, ENPN data portal, uh, the GB Student data portal, the Catalansis and GB uh, Spain. Uh, oh, no, that's not what I want to do, <laughs> sorry. Um, so this is the end of uh, this pr presentation about the uh, communication and the documentation within the uh, community. Uh, and as, as, as always, you have the Slack channel, the Twitter account, the website. Uh, oh, it's in French, sorry. <laughs> and uh, contact uh, from Boss, Vicente and uh, myself. Uh, I think we have plenty of time for questions. Um, I don't know if there is any question. There are no questions in the chat so far, and the questions that were in the document, Marie, I think they've all been answered there. Our okay. On the, on the okay, and, that's great. And I see no hands raised, so, so far. Um, okay, uh, we are a little bit early, but I think we should continue with the last talk. So I'm going to let mm -hmm. Dave and uh, and Javier talking about the Alining, the GBIF, and the LA platform. It's a turn, Dave. Thanks, Marie. Um, oh, I can't share. I, I, my, my laptop crashed before, so I had to be readmitted. So I'm no longer a host, I think. So sorry. So if somebody can give me superpowers. Tony, you're muted. Okay, done. You're co-host now. Yeah, you have superpower now. Yeah, oh, brilliant. I assumed you already had them. <laughs> okay. 
definitely not. <laughs> okay, can you see that okay? Yes. Okay, thanks. Okay, just before I, I, I guess, my name is David Martin. Uh, I work for the Living Atlas of Australia, Atlas of Living Australia um, as a systems architect. Uh, on, on the call today as well is, is uh, Javier Molina. Uh, he's project manager for um, for this project. Do you want to say hello, Javier? Or... <laughs> Hi, everybody. Yes, as I mentioned, yes, I am currently managing the core infrastructure upgrade project. Basically, that is the big umbrella of uh, what uh, the topic of data will be today. So, and I will be just keeping an eye uh, on the chat for any specific questions. Thanks, Abe. No worries. Um, okay. Can you just... So, can you see an agenda? So slide. Yep. Yep. Yes. Sorry. Great. Thanks. Okay. So what I'm going to talk about. So I'm going to go through um, why we're we're looking at an alignment between ALA and GBIF, um, the activities that we're planning, um, to do the progress so far, future work, and then I'm going to wrap up. Okay. So for the rationale, um, so ALA and GBIF are, are two fairly well established infrastructures now. Uh, they've benefited, I think, from good consistent funding over the last few years. Uh, ALA is the Australian node to uh, GBIF, so it was an intrinsic relationship between the two things. Um, we're aware that, uh, we have, uh, for, some, uh, for some time we've been aware that there is an, an overlap in functionality and um, that's what we're trying to address. We're, we're trying to bring the projects a bit closer together so that we can reduce the, the duplication in effort, really. <clears throat> um, there's always been a, a willingness to collaborate between these two teams do, who, who know each other pretty well. Um, we've done this at the software library level for some years, but we, we've, we haven't gone so far as sharing components and looking to share services as well. Um, so not just to, to sort of, make, sort of share the burden of software development and maintenance of the software, but also look at um, the operational cost as well. So, so that's what we're, 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 that's what this project is intending to, to start to work on. Um, this is a, a diagram for what ALA is, and I, I'm not gonna go into it in, in depth. Um, you can see ALA is sort of split into these sort of five sort of um, sections with data partners, data services, web services, user applications, that's basically our, our website. Um, and then there's a, a, a bunch of um, web services, uh, websites that we support it, it with web services or, or, or user, in, user interfaces. Um, Part of what we do is this occurrence data management, as as, as anyone who's familiar with ALA will know, um, uh, and that's the area really that we're trying to address with this this overlap. Um, so the main thing is that ALA is supporting infrastructure in a number of areas. What we are trying to do is um, look for overlap with existing projects and existing infrastructure that's out there at um, um, and try and partner with 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 projects so we lead to something lead to a better outcome um, so the key reasons for aligning is to reduce the technical debt that the ALA has in general it uh, needs to be I think cognizant of the amount of technical debt it's 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 um, it has at any one time uh, we're looking for sustainable approaches looking to collaborate and looking for global services and solutions if we can find the right people to partner with. As far as aligning in this, this project's concerned, I'm really talking about the bits I've just highlighted there on, on the diagram. So that's, it's, it's occurrence, in summary, it's occurrence management, it's um, uh, metadata for <clears throat> around occurrence data, that specimen and observation data, and its user interface tools as well. Um, part of the driver of this is, uh, is, is the living atlases. 
Um, both at ALA and GBIF have provided some support for the Living Atlases over, over the years. Um, and we want to, um, on that very much to continue. We've, we've, I think we've done well in establishing a community. And what we want to do is um, develop the, make the processes around collaboration a little bit more mature than they are. At the minute, all the software for ALA is in GitHub. So anybody can download the software. And Manash was talking about how people can set it up with Ansible. Um, and that's all, all good. Um, people can raise issues and people can do pull requests, but um, we want to take it a little bit further and we, we want to put in, pro, pro, in place um, procedures, things like code standards, um, continuous build environments um, for the community at large, uh, and also give, um, give the community a, a better way of uh, prioritizing um, bits of functionality and um, and working out how things should actually be done. Um, so um, f for me, the, the important thing about the Living Atlas community was always, it was never really the software itself, uh, was never actually the software being the most important thing, it was always the community. And Another thing about the Living Atlas is it, it is born out of this frustration that some GBIF nodes have had in the past with the um, turnover of staff. Um, so we, we do think it's um, a good thing in that it's giving um, GBIF nodes who are, who are setting up portals um, a community to work with um, instead of just sort of... A, a GBIF node typically only has one, one or two um, technical people and so we, we, we think the, that, that community is, is giving um, people uh, an avenue to, to, to take on software and, and work together. So we, we very much want that to continue. So what are, what are we planning to do? So th this is back to ALA really, uh, ALA and GBIF um, right now. Uh, th there's, there's three areas of collaboration um, that um, we're, we're looking at. Uh, the first one is data ingestion, and and, and that's really, um, in, in summary, it, it's taking down core archives or current data, and pulling them into a into a system, doing um, the basic interpretation on top of that data, and then getting the data into a form where it's indexed, so it can be used by applications. So that's that's the first thing that we're look, we're interested in tackling. Both the GBIF and ALA do that um, with their with their software stacks, and we want to bring those two things together, two 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 projects together. Registries. Um, so one of the first thing that ALA uh, ALA did was it put in place a a metadata registry for collection level um, metadata. So it was it was really targeted at describing the natural history collections for Australia and uh, attributing data as best we can at the, to, to the collection level. Um, over recent years, GBIF have, have been uh, done a lot of work in this area and they've been incorporating collections catalogs such as GR Bio. Uh, and that's really reduced the functional gap between these two solutions. Uh, there still is some things to work through, but we, we think um, we can um, work with GBIF to just to have a single a single single uh, solution there, a single service that we can we can all use. Um, and the last thing is occurrence APIs. Both GBIF and ALA have uh, occurrence APIs for searching and, and mapping. Um, they both have both built on similar principles of stateless uh, web services, um, but they are different. They, uh, they are. Um, uh, different APIs, and we want to bring those together. We think that there's benefits there in terms of reuse of UI components, um, but also there's things like um, our, our libraries. Both ALA and GBIF have our packages. Uh, GBIF has a Python package as well um, that are wrappers around web services. So we really want to try and align those these efforts efforts around around these things. 
Okay, so th those are the three areas um, that we want to to, fo to work on. Um, this is where we're at with, with, with those areas. So we started work on the data ingestion side of things, <coughs> excuse me, uh, back in April, uh, just, uh, just when uh, everything changed. Um, and that, that's still going and we've made some good progress on, on that front. And we hope to tackle registries and APIs and UI uh, next year, <coughs> excuse me. Um, okay, so progress, <coughs> excuse me. Okay, so um, as I said, stage one, just, stage one has started. We've got three developers working on that and the business has an analyst and project manager. Um, what it really entails is adopting um, the GBIF pipelines implementation, and that's the GBIF's um, implementation, which is based on um, a technology called the Apache Beam, and um, which runs on on top of uh, Apache Spark uh, in, in a clustered environment, optionally in a clustered environment. Um, it's intended to be the way GBIF have done it. It's intended so that it can be run um, with or without a cluster. So. Uh, but it's that's the, that's the platform that GBIF have, have, have built their data ingestion um, tooling around, and that's that's taking the DOM core archive, interpreting the data, <coughs> and um, uh, indexing it, and uh, so it's 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 visible in the GBIF website, and it supports things like downloads. Um, so we're, we've been working with GBIF around code standards, integration, testing. We've been setting up regular meetings and 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 setting up um, basically working through how we're going to work together uh, for for this stage and and for future stages. And also with with one eye on on opening this this up to uh, the wider community to to work on together. Um, so we're, we're, we're trying to align the interpretation of, of occurrence data. That's the first thing that we're doing. Um, so on, in this slide, we've got a, 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 the same iNaturalist record in, from a, a, that's visible in ALA, it's visible in GBIF. There's, there's slight differences in, in, the, in the way things are interpreted and that slight differences in, th in um, our abilities to parse dates in various formats and um, that sort of thing. Um, it, it's there's also subtleties in um, the way DAO and Core is processed. Um, and DAO and Core is a, fan, you know, a fantastic standard for us. It's a great that we we have that. But um, there's there's some things that sort of slip through the cracks uh, a little bit, or, or or leave the data open to to a little bit of interpretation. An example of this would be. Um, Presence and absence data. So there was a, a discussion on on um, on a uh, in, in the Jiva pipelines project on how to interpret um, um, records as being present or absent based based on uh, values in the individual counts and uh, uh, the current status down core terms. Uh, bearing in mind that we we're largely dealing with um, historic data sets that we can't change, or it's, it's difficult to to get back to the data custodian to change to, to fix up. So it's we need to know what work out what we can do as the, to do uh, the best best thing we can to make this make the data usable. Um, so it's things like this that um, are in data around date parsing, scientific name parsing, um, and other things, um, and we want to do these things. In a consistent manner, so that when you come to ALA, ALA's site or any living out the site or um, or GBIF, we're saying the same things about this about the same data. <coughs> so, so this is rough. This is simplification, really. But this is essentially what our current architecture looks like for ALA. So, um, so on on the left hand side, we've got these services that we've written, we've written 
things for storing images, things for processing sensitive data. We've got our collectory, which is our data registry. We've got our, some spatial services that sit on top of um, polygon layers and raster layers for environmental services. And so we take a Darwin Core archive. We, we have this thing called the biocache, which pulls the data in, ingests the data, and talks to those services, then goes across and generates an index. And then that index is used by our API. And ultimately that's what's used. The, the end user sees the, the results of that indexing. Um, so what GBIS pipelines is for us and for the stage one is really just a replacement of that biocache box. Uh, we're seeing it as a pretty much a drop in replacement for that after we've done the work of integrating with our existing services. So our image service, our sensitive data service are, aren't going anywhere for, for stage one. So we still need to keep, um, keep, keep those things working. Pipeline um, is um, essentially is is what what is, is used is the terminology for the thing that runs the, the data ingestion. Um, it's taking it's taking the, the Darwin Core archive, putting it through um, a sausage machine, and now comes an index at the end essentially. But the, the pipeline consists of. Um, the cold transforms, well, I'm going to refer to them as modules for this presentation. The, the, there's various modules in these pipelines that deal with particular aspects of the data. So they, there's a, in the GBIF uh, interpretation pipeline, there's a taxonomy module that's, that's dealing with scientific name parsing and classification. There's a location module that's dealing with uh, parsing uh, coordinates and dealing with things like projections and that sort of thing. There's another module for dealing with the Audubon core extension. Um, so see what the, the ALA will develop its own pipeline, but we will be reusing the uh, these modules where we can. Um, and we've been looking at uh, our own code base and looking for functional gaps between these things and working with GBIT to, to, to fill these things in. There are some a fairly extensions that are specific to the living atlases. So there's the ability to use a, a national taxonomy. Um, so we've added a, a module for that. Uh, this integration with our, our special layers and there's integration with support for handling sensitive data. So. One key difference, I guess, at the minute with ALA and GBIF is all the data in GBIF is, is fully public. Uh, ALA and other living atlases deal with um, records that need to be sensitive, uh, regarded as sensitive, and we need to remove the, the uh, coordinates uh, for, or re reduce the quality of the coordinates for certain species. So that's a, that's a key thing that ALA is, uh, needs to carry on supporting. Um, so when, when, once we've got stage one complete, um, what we'll have is we'll have a common code base. We're, we're working from the same GitHub repository. As I said, we're going through the process of working, working out how we work together. Uh, we've tackled a lot of those things and we're working through things like code standards and that sort of thing. Uh, but the output from stage one will be a single code base. Um, it's reduced duplication uh, of, uh, of of code for doing the same sort of interpretation. Uh, it'll be consistent. So if you're looking at these records on, on the different sites, they'll, they'll look the same. Um, and it's also an avenue for exploring shared infrastructure. Um, this is a, a bit of a can of worms, but ultimately we, we, it, we, we are interested in how much of these things we can do together. Um, as I said, consider thinking about the operational cost of, of running some of these things. So the living atlas, um, we, 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 plan, we already are working closely with the living atlas coordinators on this. Uh, so um, Vincente has been, uh, there's been some great work for, as already for as part of this project to help us um, provide a, an interface ar around pipelines. 
um, so that we can run. There's a similar sort of interface for the biocache already. So we're really hoping this will be a, a, um, a drop-in replacement for one command line interface tool for another to actually run the, this, this data ingestion. Uh, we will be developing contribution guides with GBIF on how to um, submit pull requests, what coding standards are expected. Um, one outcome is uh, we think this will be cheaper for um, living atlases to run, particularly um, living atlases that are using a, a Cassandra cluster at the moment to, to run. So that's the, big, the bigger um, installations. It, the Cassandra cluster will no longer be required, so that should re reduce the reduce uh, some of the infrastructure costs. Um, for future work, we hope this collaboration is something we're, we're just going to build on. Both ALA and GBIF have an, an, inch, uh, an interest in exploring its uh, adding support, better support for event-based data. This is part of ALA's strategic plan. It's, hope, it's something we hope to start doing next year. Uh, and that includes support for ENA, eDNA data and long-term monitoring data. Um, we are, as I said at the start, we're also keen to, to explore use of um, global services, working on global services together. We've got this, this sort of less than ideal scenario now that ALA has a an annotation service so you can log into the ala and <clears throat> you can say i think this record is um is misidentification or i can say that the coordinates are, i don't think the coordinates are correct um, and that annotation will, will be visible on the occurrence page for the atlas living australia but it, if that same record is ingested into gbif and um, users won't see that um, and we, i think we all, all agree that that's, that's suboptimal uh, and that's some, so an annotation service that we can all tap into is something that we uh, are interested in exploring um, similarly for sensitive data as, as i said ala handles sensitive data reduces coordinates for for sensitive records um, i think this is a common thing uh, this is, is something that other living atlases use already um but it's um i think it's, a, it's something that's makes sense for a, a global service of some sort um so if, if we did reach that goal of, of shared infrastructure uh, there's the potential of sharing costs for infrastructure costs and operational costs um, we can look at things we could look at having certain interpretations just around once and this replication of inputs and outputs um, this all these things start to become possible once we once we tackle this first stage <clears throat> so in, in conclusion um this is a a little bit of I'm a bit of a, um, a music uh, geek, so you'll forgive me for, for this. And it is it's past ten here, so uh, the main aims of this project were sustainability, and I was looking for some sort of analogy, so I went with some sort of music analogy. So I see this project as giving us sustainability. What we have here is a, a Les Paul 1959. It is known for its um, note sustain. Um, working for consistency, um, this is a, a 1957 Fender Esquire, known for its consistency in factory production. This is this is Johnny Cash and Six Strings. And the last one is collaboration. So this is three things. So this is a collaboration between uh, Gibson Les Paul. In 1979, they came together with their Moog synthesizers and produced a, a Les Paul with a synthesizer inside the guitar, uh, which is um, a little bit crazy, but ah, that's, that's, that's good fun as far as I'm concerned. But yeah, those are those are the three outcomes um, that that we're really aiming for out of this project. So, uh, just in final conclusion, we started on this journey. 
Um, we're going to keep on updating the Living Artists community and get them involved. I want to say just a quick thanks to the GBIF team. They've been very supportive so far. That includes uh, Tim Robinson, Matt Blissett, Nikolai Volek, and uh, Fede Mendes. And they've all been um, great to work with so far. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Dave, for your presentation. Um, we have uh, 14 minutes for question or discussion. If you if you want, I know that I saw on the chat that people wanted to to ask questions. So uh, maybe uh, I'm sorry if I. Also, but there is, I think, uh, Joey Poland, I'm sorry if I say your name incorrectly, who had question. Maybe you can unmute you if you want. Uh, sure. Um, I have a question about command line tools uh, and sort of the use of those, but um, Javier told me that uh, this would be discussed in the next session. Or at least, uh, uh, that's, that's, sorry about the confusion. Uh, it, was, it was precisely the part of the command lines is uh, what they was showing on this session, but probably not directly related with the Darwin core archives that you are uh, chasing. Yes. But uh, around that, a uh, team already was mentioning, sorry, Tim Robertson, uh, that indeed uh, that, that can be done, right? I mean, the, those common, uh, common tools interface. And I think, uh, was it you also, uh, Vicente, just adding the, that those uh, common line interfaces for Darwin Core Archive Management uh, can be integrated on the pipelines, uh, like in Travis, uh, CI. In our case, in the case, a particular case uh, of the ALA, we use Jenkins, basically to orchestrate all our uh, data processing or an ingestion. Okay, thank you. Um, I, so maybe a follow-up question would be, why, why aren't these command line tools there yet? Right? Because um, if you uh, build uh, these big frameworks based on Apache Beam, you have to install a lot of things right, to run these, uh, run these processes. Um, so could you comment on that? Would you like to address that in that type or probably Vicente? Because I think it is more about all the processing or... Is, is this the, is, are you talking about the system as a, our current production system or what, what I've been talking about, sorry. I was talking about the uh, Apache Beam framework. It's a really nice framework, but you, it, it has a lot of dependencies, right? It does have a lot of dependencies, um, but um, I mean, as far as, as, as using uh, what we're doing here is concerned, we've we've tackled the problem of um, of those dependencies, that dependency management. Um, building these projects is um, it, it it can be quite involved, um, but as as far as the living atlases are concerned, um, and people trying to use this use what GWIF have done on our extensions. Uh, the project is built, um, it's it can be deployed with, with Ansible. Um, what you'll have there is a, a command line in interface for running an ingestion and it can be run on a, a just on a single virtual machine or, or your laptop, or it can be run on, on a Spark cluster. Okay, thank you. I'm not sure I answered your question, but happy to happy to have another go. Uh, I have a question from uh, Sylvain. Um, when you say no console, uh, no Cassandra cluster, there will be no Cassandra the database anymore. Solar indexer will become the main storage. The, the main storage, I, 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 I battled with myself with how much detail to go into, technical detail to go into in, in the presentation, but um, the main storage for the, the outputs of uh, the interpretation 
is uh, Apache Avro, which is a file format. So, um, so we take Darwin Core archives, we run them through the pipelines, and the outputs of, of those pipelines is um, Apache Avro files. Um, so each of those modules uh, that was in one of those diagrams, like the location module, the taxonomy module, the order one core module, they all produced um, a uh, it's, it's produced files in Avro format. Um, so there's no single consolidated database uh, at, until there's no consol single consolidated index of all the data until we do um, we generate an elastic search or, or a solar index. Um, so essentially, it's just it's a file system. The, a, a file system replaces the uh, Cassandra database. Uh, I have another question. I mean, I asked the question like this, but some people also answer on the documents. So you will have a double answer. But from uh, Ken Ichidweda, I'm sorry if I say your name wrong. Uh, if there was a global annotation infrastructure, what kind of identifier would it use? JB fonts? Good question. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to come up with a quick answer to that. Uh, I think it's one for discussion. Um, how, it's all about stability, I think, of occurrence IDs, isn't it? Um, ideally, uh, all data publishers are providing nice, globally, global, persistent um, occurrence IDs, and that's what we'd use. Um, but um, yeah, it's. Definitely an open question. <laughs> a good question. Um, we have uh, another question on the chat from New York. Uh, if LA will be using the JB ingestion libraries, does that mean LA will be able to ingest ABCD as well? ABCD as well. Um, it's not something we've considered really, actually, for Australia. Uh, I'm aware that. Uh, at, uh, that um, there's the still um, crawling capabilities in, in Jiva for ABCD. Um, so I'll say yes, but I'm not sure <laughs> uh, in terms of how, how, how that would be supposed. I mean, in theory, um, if if we if we could reuse the the module, the crawling module, and that. that that GBIF had written out of the box, and that was writing data into into the um, uh, interpreted Avro files. Then we do things on top of that. So, so I'll say yes in theory, but it's it's not something that we've looked into. Okay, we have time for let's say a, a last question. You can raise your hand or you can ask on the chat or on the documents. I know it's pretty late for our talkers, so we may not keep it really long. No question? OK, so I want to thanks I think a Tim, lot. Oh, Tim, sorry. Tim raised his hand. I did, I, I did oh. raise my hand. I was actually, oh, uh, I was going to ask if Matt Yoda, he's on the call. Um, he wrote earlier in the chat when Dave was talking um, about uh, services for collections. And I was wondering if he could elaborate a little on what he would like, um, what is his needs and wishes around um, collection registration and collection services, if he's willing. So yeah, I, I detailed a little bit more in the in the text document, in the Etherpad documents. Um, and I'm not sure I'm getting the resource quite right, but basically I'm looking for a service that lets me call down a global list of collections, right? So when we say that a specimen is in some repository, 
as we're curating our data, either as a museum or a researcher, um, we need access to that global list. And GR Bio had that list going for a bit and it looked like there was potential there and then it went dark. So we downloaded that list and basically made CRUD um, functionality on top of that. And I think I heard the, G the GBIF was going to work on that. So I'm not sure if that's exactly what you were talking about here, but just having that very simple um, call down a repository and then maybe like an object request broker where if if we don't find what we want, then we stub a, uh, an ID for the one that the um, curator thinks they need. And then we could periodically go back and figure out, okay, this is a good one. They've, they've validated my request. It's a real repository. Or this is the real repository. Your request is not um, not necessary. You should go point this. So very simple in terms of services. It's just that the aggregation of the world's collections are in one place, like in the simplest way, behind a autocomplete, right? And okay. Uh, can, can I respond to that? Is that okay, Marie? She's nodding. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, thanks, Matt. So, so this is Tim Robertson. I work at GBIF. Uh, we did resurrect uh, GR Bio. It's GR Cycle. It's slightly broader than just biology. Um, we imported the same dump that you downloaded, but it had started to get edited again. So we've now got a wide group of editors. We've implemented a synchronization with Index of Ariorum. So Index of Ariorum is updating GR Cycle now. We've been working closely with the IDIC bio folks and are very close to importing all of their collections catalog into GR Cycle. Um, that's already in the test environment. After we import those data, the IDIC bio team and the GBIF uh, team will be editing the data together. So we, we broaden our pool of editors um, and build our capacity. Um, we're exploring with the NCBI folks in the US to synchronize with bio repositories or bio registries, their, their tool. Uh, what Dave was talking about is Australia's wish to link up all the Australian collection catalog. And that's in both the GBIF and ALA work program for next year. Um, so things are beginning to move. Um, there's still a lot to do, um, but it is becoming uh, a active catalog again. And every, to every session that I'm in, someone else comes forward and indicates that they're also um, curating this kind of content. So what we're going to try and do next year within the GBIF community is try and broaden the editorial groups that are working together. Um, you and I have never met, but uh, I can see you now. And uh, I, I, I'd like to talk to you a little bit more about that. Um, perhaps sometime after this session next week or in the coming weeks. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Sounds great. Uh, we have a last question uh, from Sylvain who asks, will the download feature be re-implemented as a part of this new JBIF LA pipeline? I'll, I'll answer that, I guess. Um, so uh, after this stage one's complete, there won't actually be any visible API changes. So what works today will work after stage one's complete. Um, after we re-implement the state of ingestion with GBIS pipelines. Um, in the in the last the last stage of this project will be the the, uh, the APIs, uh, and it will be re when we get to that we'll be looking to work out how we realign the two APIs, which will probably mean deprecating <coughs> the existing existing API in, in favor of of um, some sort of hybrid between ALA and GBIF, um, but. Um, there will be a download API. Um, okay. Thank you all for your time. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, uh, Javier. Thank you, Manash. Thank you, Silva and Vicente, Connie, and Paula for helping us to organize this symposium. Thank you all for joining us. I hope you learned a lot today. <laughs>